Welcome back to uh, the second part of our Theology of the Body series, in which we'll be looking at the very first cycle of John Paul II's Theology of the Body. Uh, John Paul II's Theology of the Body audiences are, are a compelling reflection on the biblical theology of creation. And this begins in the first cycle of talks, which were originally delivered from September 1979 to April 1980, so the very first section of that cycle of talks. The Pope begins his theology of the body with a reflection upon the beginning, the beginning of everything. Now, instead of launching into an abstract theological or scientific explanation of the beginning, John Paul, the, the great playwright, the poet, brings to his audience and to us today a narrative. He drops us into the middle of the story of the creation of the cosmos. And he also draws our attention to the beginning of humanity. Now the way he does this is to drop us into the middle of a very dramatic dispute. This dispute is a very lively one about marriage and divorce, about sexual fidelity, and about broken commitment. Could almost be a soap opera, couldn't it? Um, a question that comes up untold times throughout history, throughout the history of the whole of humanity, not just of our recent history. Later on in the series, he will say, this is a perennial question. What does marriage mean? How should we stay married? How do we, married, how do we stay faithful? And this biblical story adverts to a question we always ask. Now the dispute is retold in the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 19, 3 to 8, and St Mark's Gospel, chapter 10 to 9. And it describes an encounter, a very decisive encounter, between Jesus and the Jewish religious authorities. This is what theology of the body says. The Pharisees came to him to test him and to ask him, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? Here is John Paul quoting the text. John Paul then makes a striking and key theological point here because this dispute, this question, is asked of the word of God. It's asked of Jesus. And it is the word of God who teaches us how to read the scriptures correctly. The incarnated word, the word made flesh, is the last word on the scriptural word. I remember I was saying that John Paul was working in the theatre of the word. So this is a very clever allusion to the, to the word, the power of the word, and the biblical sense the theological sense of Christ as the word of God. Now in this scene, the Pharisees are told by Christ to go back and reread two scriptural accounts of creation. So Jesus Christ cuts through the speculation about marital custom, social convenience, and the clever intellectualizations which the Pharisees want to engage him in. He cuts through the whole thing. Go back to the beginning. He accuses them with the equivalent in biblical language, the you don't get it, do you? So here are the religious authorities being told, you don't get it, you don't get the word of God. The Pharisees have lost sight of a key pillar of mature Jewish faith. That is, that existence is not a brute fact, but has immense personal value. It's not just a piece of law. The world is not simply full of random, meaningless stuff, but is part of a love letter and an invitation from the Creator to humanity. So Jesus accused them of not understanding that, not understanding even the meaning of the law. And there are three senses in which Jesus refers to the beginning. In the beginning, he wants the Pharisees to re-look at the beginning. And he is the authoritative guide here. 
First of all, he points out that the origin of all things, and especially of humanity, is that it comes from the hand of the Creator. Secondly, Jesus means his interlocutors to go back to first principles, to the foundations of the word, the logos, to go back to the meaning of all things, the truth of all things. And thirdly, Jesus reveals something about himself, something about his own mission and his identity. He is the logos. He is the truth. He is the word through whom all things have been made. He stands at the beginning of all things and all things have been made in him in truth and love. To see the beginning and therefore to see ourselves clearly, John Paul II reminds us that this biblical story points us back to the biblical story of the beginnings, the origins, and that these should be read through bifocal glasses, a bit like mine. You need two lenses. There are two beginnings, if you remember. Sometimes we forget that. There are two beginnings at the beginning of the scriptures, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I don't know whether you've noticed that, but we have two beginnings. Both of them provide us with complementary readings, two different perspectives which essentially work together, like the lenses in glasses. The first chapter of Genesis is written like a rhythmic hymn. You might have to go back and read that to remember that. It's a liturgical account. And it's called by biblical scholars the priestly account for that reason. It's written with a sensitivity to the rhythm of a hymn. And it has, a, if you remember, a repeated chorus of God's making and his resting. There was the beginning, it was good, the end of the first day, the beginning of the second day. It makes several vital theological points that man and woman, woman uh, make up the whole of humanity together. Man and woman, he made, the, made him. Humanity is man and woman. They are made equally but distinctive. And together they represent and make up humanity. It affirms that two incarnations, as John Paul II calls it, of being human. And these two in incarnations, man and woman, stand at the apex of God's creation, the apex of the hymn of creation. And their role at the apex of creation reflects the fruitfulness of the other creatures in creation as well. But they, unlike all the other wonderful creatures that we hear about in Genesis 1, are made, the scripture tells us, in the image and likeness of God, the image and likeness of the creator, which is a very important point. The creator blesses all beings and all being as good. But if you remember, he blesses human beings as very good. He's, if you like, putting his thumbprint on humanity as a special part of creation that somehow shares in his nature in a very important way. John Paul II reveals that he has a very, as much as he loves the first Genesis story, he has a particular interest in the second chapter of Genesis and in the third chapter of Genesis. Quite often uh, the church's teaching has revolved around the first chapter of Genesis, go forth and multiply. And that's very true. There's some great truths in the first Genesis story. But here John Paul II is saying, let us look at the next two chapters. Now, Chapters 2 and 3 are believed by biblical scholars to come from a much older source and they are written in a much older narrative style. They provide us with a profound insight into the bodily, emotional and sexual aspects of our human experience, both as they're given to us by God and as they are changed by the ingratitude of our sin. In the, first, the Pope's first cycle of talks, the word original, as we've said, is a theological key. In using this word original, the Pope tries to trace the family likeness 
between the original human couple with its original desires, its original self-awareness, its original happiness, its enrich and its original innocence, its purity of its vision. And he tries to compare that, so there's a continuity between that and our own desires for love, communion, fulfilment as men and women today. So the Pope speaks a little bit more about this building up of the picture of humanity in biblical wisdom, about human responsibility and the mysterious fact that our bodies, and therefore we ourselves, are made of what Genesis 2 calls dust of the earth and the breath of God. C.S. Lewis actually talks about this. We're made of dust, dust of the earth and God's breath, or stardust and God's breath. Beautiful image. In our supposedly scientific mindset today, it's easy for us to dismiss those household names of Adam and Eve and the meaning of their dramatic discovery of each other and the temptation. Of course, we all know, don't we, that the apple is not actually in the Genesis story. <laughs> There is certainly fruit, but it's not an apple as far as we know. And it's easy to dismiss Adam and Eve as a sort of archaic comic strip. You probably see images of Adam and Eve anywhere you type them in, Google them in, and you'll see a thousand different versions of Adam and Eve. And it's easy to dismiss the story of Adam and Eve, particularly chapter 2, as a kind of fairy story. Now, it really should be said here and reminded to us by J.R.R. Tolkien and his great work, that mythical stories are anything but shallow or childish. In fact, we know The Lord of the Rings is actually one of the most popular stories. It's grabbed popular imagination. Genesis 2 is written in a more mythic form, but that's not to say that it's any less powerful and true and perhaps even more so. And John Paul II insists that the Genesis accounts here are not just interesting or classical myths. They're not archaeological uh, items of interest. They are definitive stories. They are profoundly true. He describes it as proto-history, just before the recorded history of humanity. But this story is endorsed by Jesus Christ himself as an argument about marriage an illustration of marriage. This means that these narratives are so deeply revealing and theologically true that although they describe and depict a time before human history officially began, they are also at the heart of our own story today and for the future. Now, in this, the Pope demonstrates using his own new language and his own terminology, which is sometimes a bit challenging, I admit, that although Genesis chapter 2 is concise, every single phrase explores some key aspect of who we are and our person-to-person -person relationships. So even though it only is contained in a few lines, what we find there is something that tells us the truth about God's relationship to humanity, our creation story, our, our place in creation, the relationship between male and female, the relationship between parent and child, the relationship between the lover and the beloved. This chapter of the Bible also gives us a deeply imaginative story, if you like, an inside drama of what the Pope calls our self-understanding. We hear Adam's thoughts. We connect to his feelings and desires. Again, it's the Pope, the dramatist, knowing how to get inside the drama. In Genesis 2, God the Creator is imagined metaphorically. The language used for God's concern and his creative love is of God amongst us, walking amongst us. It's not like that pop song that says, God is viewing us from a distance, or God is seeing us from a distance. Here, Genesis' story depicts God as a father gardener who has infinite interest in us and walks through the garden. 
He's, he's almost, you can almost hear his footsteps in the Garden of Eden. And he muses to himself. We hear God musing within his own mind, I will do, I am thinking. And he gets his hands dirty. He starts making things with his hands. He digs his hands into the earth. He's an artist. He makes man with his hands out of the soil. And again, this is such a different picture of God than perhaps many today have of him as a distant watchmaker or of a, a spiritual, impersonal force. The second creation account told in this Yahweh story, that's what this, the author of this story is called, the Yahweh, because he uses the word Yahweh, the, the sacred name for God the Creator. And it's different from chapter 1. Presents The, the picture that the Yahweh uses is of this boundary time, this time before history, when humanity emerged in a garden. It explores the experience of primeval innocence before social and psychological and spiritual damage can be seen in the human soul, in the human person. Before human sin, before physical sickness, before selfishness became part of our historical landscape, before we began to feel threatened by our environment, before there was violence. And the Pope reflects upon this ancient story through the lens, again, of this gospel conversation which, which Jesus uses to remind the Pharisees that even though Israel's history has been affected by this hardness of heart, which is the source of all this disruption in our experience of creation, John Paul points out that Jesus says, this was not always so. This is not how God planned it to be. John Paul then says, we are the heirs to a blessed inheritance, which includes not only our moral awareness, for example, our ability to tell right from wrong, our moral sense, but also we have a blessed beginning in our bodily experiences as well. Our deep existential experiences are also blessed. They're originally good and great. And the Pope here cites St Paul's words that not only our minds and our souls but also our bodies groan inwardly for redemption, for a taste of this original goodness. In this the Pope suggests that our deepest desires, are felt, which are felt so strongly in our bodies, although they are in need of cultivation, of interpretation and grace, nonetheless have their roots in the same faithful experiences of the original man and woman at the beginning. There's an innocence that we can sometimes still sense in our own experiences, despite all the vicissitudes of our current time. Now let's look closely at some of these original experiences because they're very evocative. Um, they really help us to see what John Paul II is doing with us. What the Pope means by original experiences is that when God first made humanity, he planted these original, this original shape of our experiences, his own voice. I've called it the music, the music as a chord. There are three chords of God's voice sounding in our existential experiences, in our deepest thoughts, in our deepest desires. And in our first series, we described a little bit what they mean. But let's unpack them one by one. And let's recap what they include. These experiences, the Pope says, are primeval. They're from the beginning. They're universal. We, the Pope insists that everybody touches these original experiences. Everybody knows them deeply within themselves. And thirdly, that they reveal the insight of love true love, but also the insight of God's original purpose in giving us these experiences. Let's start with the original solitude, the first of the original experiences, and it follows chronologically in the unfolding of the story of Genesis 2. Here God makes what in Hebrew is called hadam, 
And you can probably guess that Hadam is not just a name, Adam, it's a description. That means something like an earthling, a mud man, a man made of mud. Hadam here represents all mankind in the second Genesis story. It means humanity, man and woman, boy and girl. So God makes Hadam with his hands. And there's a moment of wonderful intimacy in the Genesis story. God blows his divine breath into the nostrils of Adam, blows his own divine life spirit into the mud man, who prior to that has, you imagine, almost being a little muddy, not alive man. So his life is blown in to Hadam, into Adam. And this means that what comes alive, the man that comes alive in God's breath, has a higher and direct spiritual inheritance from God himself, much more than the animals have. Adam experiences his body and senses his body as a spiritual and moral and intellectual being. And he realises by looking down on his body and thinking about his world around him that he cannot find the same community, communication or love with the other creatures, as beautiful and as useful as they are. I sometimes imagine him trying to have a conversation with a crocodile or trying to talk to the fish and thinking, there's just not a lot coming back here. <laughs> not, I haven't got that same sense of community that I so long for and that seems to have been implanted in me by God. But what Adam does have, and we should dwell a little bit on here, is he has an awareness and capacity for self-knowledge. And we know that he has free will because the Pope points this out, that before anything else happens in Genesis, he's called to make decisions. He's called to have a vocation. This is what he calls the original solitude, a call to free will, to responsibility. In Adam, every human being, every individual person is given a vocation and a task. That's the first thing. Our original solitude is for a purpose. God calls humanity in what John Paul calls a partnership with the absolute. In Genesis 2, 16, 7, Adam is called to be a caring and conscientious gardener, just like God, to work in God's service, to cultivate the ground. And he's got one other job, which everyone seems to remember, to name the creatures, to, in a sense, be a custodian of the creatures, to give them a name, to have something of God's power, because God, in the Jewish thinking, God's naming is also a creative thing. It makes something happen. So Adam, in his original solitude, has a very busy first day, doesn't he? He's got to name the creatures. He's told what he can and cannot do. He's told that he needs to look and tend for the garden. He's all, and especially he's told to be, respect God's covenant, do you remember, God says, do not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. He has the whole of this amazing garden to forage in. It seems that everything's available for him there. But not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what Adam discovers then is that no one but Adam, or me today, can make my or Adam's decision. In other words, John Paul's alluding to that unique thing, power that we have of moral responsibility. No one can make moral decisions for us, but we ourselves, out of our own knowledge, will and freedom. And our bodies create and reveal the secret of this immense power and responsibility that we have. Each one of us is unrepeatable. We have an identity that will never occur again in the history of the world. Adam's body is a sign of his original solitude, his individuality. Perhaps paradoxically, it's once we are mature enough to be alone with God that we can adequately hear the weight of God's decree. It's only once we've taken responsibility that we understand and appreciate our identity that we're then ready for a relationship. 
Perhaps paradoxically, it's only once Adam has had his full day of being morally responsible and aware and looking after the garden and understanding his relationship with God that he is mature enough to be alone with God. That he can hear what God then decides, which is that it is not good for man to be alone. This is sometimes left out of the discussion about theology of the body, that this original solitude is good in the process of developing maturity and self-mastery. The Pope suggests that those who run away from this original solitude, that is being alone before God, this face-to-face -face relationship with God, cannot adequately give themselves in maturity to others. The Pope moves further into his exegesis of Genesis chapter 2 in his Wednesday audience talks by exploring another key experience and now we bridge into another key experience, these original experiences that he wants to unfold for us. And that is referring back to Genesis 1, that man is male and female from the beginning. Here the Pope captures God and Adam's sense that something is missing in Adam's life in the garden. Something's missing from even this extraordinarily beautiful garden of creation. It is the creator who then decrees again, it is not good for man to be alone, Genesis 2.18. But this is a surprising statement because isn't Adam surrounded by a wealth of bodies and wonderful life forms? The Genesis author underlines the fact that none of these creatures feels original solitude. None of these creatures has a face-to-face -face relationship with God, nor are any of these creatures given the moral responsibility which Adam has. None of them experience creation in this deeply personal way in which Adam experiences it. John Paul then moves into what he calls the second experience, the second original experience, a heartfelt experience, the longing for what he calls original unity. Now this is felt in Adam as a keen desire for community, a keen desire for interrelationship, not only with the transcendent God and not only with a crowd of other people, but with one beloved other person, a beloved who is both like and unlike him. This is a very key part of John Paul's reflection. And so in the Genesis story, we see that Adam is cast by the Lord God into a deep sleep. The Hebrew word is tarimah, deep sleep, very deep sleep. And it appears in other places as the, in the Bible as an experience, it's almost like a death. It's so profoundly deep. It's like a death-like unconsciousness. And usually in the Bible when this word appears, it's a sign that something new is going to happen. It's a momentous event. It's going down into the depths of yourself, down into the depths of reality. Now, while Adam is in his state, a state of unconsciousness, God creates Eve. And it's very interesting to reflect on Eve's creation. She's not created as a product of Adam. She's not created from the earth in the same way as, as Adam has been, but she's not a product of Adam either. She's not his sidekick, if you like. She's directly created as her own original solitude in the full and equal dignity of a human person. The Bible then describes God's new creation of the woman Eve from the rib bone and from the flesh of Adam. God voices his plan here. I will make a helpmate fit, and sometimes the word is akin to him. Genesis 2.18. The Hebrew word here is Caesar kenego, and it fascinates the Pope. He, he really dwells on this. And he begins an exploration in his theology of the body of the way this language is translated in a number of different European languages. And he notices that each captures a different aspect of the moral and philosophical importance of the creation of Eve. The word helpmate or companion helper is very far from some concepts of women. For instance, it doesn't mean housemaid. It doesn't mean slave. It doesn't mean sex object. Unfortunately, women have often been reduced to those status in the history of our world. It doesn't mean any of those things. 
And the other word that he, he is fascinated by is the word akin, or fit, or apt. The idea of Eve being grafted out of the bone of Adam, bone grafted, alerts us to the fact that the Bible is convinced that Adam and Eve belong to the same family. They are children of the same father. They're not from Venus or Mars, you know this. <laughs> They're both from the earth. The Pope implies elsewhere that men and women need to acknowledge that they are brothers and sisters. And they need to acknowledge this as in a sense of dignity before they ever learn to be lovers in a mature sense. And Adam and Eve, Adam in his cry recognises both those things. The Genesis text captures this in Adam's awakening from his deep unconsciousness. The text suggests that he cries out, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. He's overwhelmed by a mixture of powerful feelings and a sense of homecoming. He says, at last, at last, I've been longing for this. I've been longing for this, this gap in my, in my heart and in my soul. At last, even though in the biblical story it only appears to be about a day. So it's like an eternity he's been waiting for this. And it's a mixture of things of this at last is of my family, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She is my sister in one sense. And it also implies a healthy sexual attraction and a joy. All these feelings bundled up in that one line. Again, the Pope's suggesting this is an original experience. This is something that we as human beings know when we meet our beloved. We know this mixture of feelings. The very far last words we hear uttered by man are like a poignant love song. It's a precursor of what the Pope recognises in that incredibly powerful poetry that appears in the biblical book, The Song of Songs. So there's an echo of that erotic love which Adam feels for Eve in the later scripture, story, scripture book. And all the many marriage chants and love songs that we find in every culture and every time are a reflection, sometimes just a pale reflection, sometimes a corny reflection, sometimes a superficial reflection, but nonetheless a reflection of the power of that recognition by Adam, that cry of Adam. If you like, I sometimes call it the original wedding march, the recognition of a beloved. Adam greets Eve with both absolute surprise at her bodily difference and with a recognition at last that she is the right one. She is the one. She is the very one. John Paul notes that the text suggests that these feelings are returned by Eve for Adam. So we can imagine her perhaps crying. It's not included in the text, but there is a suggestion that this is a mutual recognition. Now, Adam and Eve at this blessed time experienced love in all its integrity as a knowledge, as a decision, as a passionate response to value of each other. This is sexual love in its truest and its fairest form. Fair and true love is a theme that John Paul II is fascinated by from his time as a playwright. Some years ago, there was a book called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. I've just referred to that. And it became a bestseller. People were fascinated not only by the obvious genetic and physical differences between men and women, but the way these differences express themselves in different ways in which men and women respond to the world and to each other. Did any of you, some of you may have read that book, and it's a fascinating read. For many years, we've been told that these gender differences are only superficial, only socially or culturally created, or sometimes only politically enforced. But the Pope here says, and reaffirms that masculinity and femininity are two incarnations of human personhood designed and blessed by the creator and written into our bodies from the beginning. They're not made up, they're real, they're embodied. But at the same time, they're not so different that we are from a different planet. Genesis suggests that God did not simply create a simple carbon copy of Adam and give him a companion, like another bloke, let's say, but someone different but of his family, 
like Eve. There is something intended by God about this complementary relationship. Jesus, in his debate with the Pharisees about divorce and marriage, refers directly to this particular text. At the foundation of all human society is the paradigm of this faithful love, this complementary relationship of one man and one woman. This is the origin of marriage, standing at the base of all culture. John Paul will point out later, this primary duality of humanity is fruitful in marriage, it creates family, it's a mirror image of consecrated life and is important to the whole wider community. So let's leave that there. Thank you. <laughs>